It is a pity that talk of the moral sentiments has fallen out of favor. Quoted, quoting Strawson 2008. Morality and morals were central topics among sociologists at the turn of the last century, but did not survive as a field of attention or inquiry. There were, of course, fields of study devoted to norms and values, to deviance and reciprocity, and more specifically, there have been notable and influential studies of moral education, moral crusades, and moral panics, but the notion that morality names a field of inquiry to which sociological ideas and techniques relate disappeared. The sociology of knowledge survived, but the sociology of morality did not. Indeed, the only discipline where morality and moral have remained central is, of course, moral philosophy. Moral philosophers have been, so to speak, the academic guardians of morality. For the philosopher, I venture to suggest, sociology's withdrawal is not a matter of regret, since the very idea of sociology of a morality might seem to make what looks like an, ac an unacceptable assumption. This is the idea that the very category of the moral, and thus within morality, what counts as moral as opposed to immoral is, as they say, a social construction. That it is socially shaped and will vary from one historical period and one social context to another, so that there are, to use an opaque phrase that will, I hope, become somewhat less so, multiple moralities, of which our own is only one among others. Talk of moralities is as unfamiliar to moral philosophers as talk of knowledge is to epistemologists. Moral philosophers are, with few and thus striking exceptions, committed to the enterprise of finding the best account of moral thinking or reasoning. They seek to justify and criticize the judgments we make when faced with moral issues. They debate with one another at different levels about the question, what is the right way to reach correct or objective or the best justified moral judgments? How they ask is one to decide moral questions. They may give complex or indecisive or multiple or skeptical or despairing answers, but that is their question. From this standpoint, the assumption indicated cannot be entertained, for if it were to be upheld, morality would cease to be the name of a stable and unified field. What is to be, what is to account what is to count as moral, and thus, I repeat, what is moral and what is immoral would be seen as varying indefinitely from context to context and subject to empirical inquiry. In this chapter, I shall examine that assumption, namely the assumption that both the content and the scope of morality vary indefinitely across different societies and contexts. Is there, in short, a convincing way for us to identify morality as a field for sociological inquiry and research that does not express and endorse our own moral outlook and thereby prejudge the limits of moral diversity? The English word morality has a range of meanings and is used in different contexts. We can distinguish two broad ranges of usage, high and low. Talk of morality is central to the reflections of certain kinds of intellectuals, 
notably philosophers, theologians, clergymen, and educators. But there is also a second everyday, lay or folk conception or range of conceptions of morality which overlap but do not coincide with the various versions of the first. In addition, then there are the natural and social scientists coming from various disciplines who seek to analyze and explain moral judgments and behavior. And is it obvious that morality is appropriate as an analytical or scientific category? What is clear is that what morality denotes is subject to endless contestation. Consider first the philosophers. G. J. Wonok starts from the Humean idea of limited sympathies. He thinks that the general object of morality is to cultivate good dispositions or moral virtues and provide moral principles that will counteract these limited sympathies and their poten potentially most damaging effects. It is, he suggests, the proper business of morality and the general object of moral evaluation to expand our sympathies or better to reduce the liability to damage inherent in their natural tendency to be narrowly restricted. A Kantian view of morality, on the other hand, focuses on the moral law and the idea that a good person is exclu exclusively motivated by the duties or obligations it imposes. Indeed, in Bernard Williams's phrase, it tries to make everything into obligations. On this view, morality involves self-denying values imposing law-like obligations and is pervaded by the language of rights and duties, commands, guilt, and blame. Contrast both these pictures with the predominant utilitarianism in the English-speaking countries in recent times, with its consequentialist focus on calculating, measuring, aggregating, and maximizing pressures or preference, satisfaction, or welfare, or on minimizing suffering, and with the revival of virtue ethics, with its roots in Aristotle, focusing on the conditions of human flourishing, or the enabling of human capabilities, or the cultivation of character. In addition, what about the scope and distribution of moral concern. Do moral judgments or rules apply to all and to all, all equally? For Kurt Bayer, adopting the moral point of view means acting on rules which are meant for everybody and which are for the good of everyone alike. And yet, as Brian Leiter reminds us, Nietzsche clearly repudiates this egalitarian premise of all contemporary moral and political theory, the premise in one form or another of the equal worth and dignity of each person. These few examples are enough to suggest not only the contestedness of the concept of morality among philosophers, but also the peculiarity of that contest. For to practice moral philosophy is to assume that it is a contest that can be won, that arguing and theorizing can in principle achieve its resolution. And yet, although, although the last hundred years of philosophical reasoning and debate have, have indeed hugely clarified the issues, they have brought us no nearer to such resolution. Nietzsche offered an interesting diagnosis of the reason why. It is precisely because moral philosophers knew the facts of morality only somewhat vaguely in an arbitrary extract or chance 
abridgment as morality of their environment, their class, their church, the spirit of their times, their climate and zone of the earth. For instance, it was precisely because they were so ill-informed and not even very inquisitive about other people's ages and former times that they did not so much as catch sight of the real problems of morality. For these come into view only if we compare many moralities. Anthropologists, on the contrary, are engaged in doing just that. Traditionally, they favored a far more capacious, capacious and relativizing approach than the philosophers did. Their professional concern was with what I have called the low sense of morality, with morality as viewed by its practitioners, with morality as mores. Thus William Graham Sumner wrote that immoral never means anything but contrary to the mores of the time and place. And Ruth Benedict wrote that morality is a convenient term for socially approved habits. However, this is clearly a thoroughly inadequate approach, since we want to know both how locals distinguish moral from non-moral customs and habits as they typically do, and how to do so ourselves. Here, more recent anthropologists though they have provided some clues, have not helped much. For as James Redlow has observed, despite some individually brilliant discussions of morality by anthropologists and the fact that some of the greatest ethnographies are dominated by the explication of moral concepts and reasoning, we do not have an account of what makes such concepts and reasoning moral, for there is no anthropology of ethics and no connected history we can tell ourselves about the study of morality in anthropology, as we do for a range of topics such as kinship, the economy, the state, or the body. Should we then look to the psychologists for help? For in recent times, they have been exploring the question of which traits are and capacities are universal, perhaps because innate, and which are subject to cultural variation. In addition, here, morality has been a central concern, generating a range of interesting and conflicting hypotheses. Eliot Turier and his colleagues have sought to show that children from a very early age are able to distinguish between the domains of the moral and the conventional. Children, they claim, can distinguish between and react differently to moral and conventional norms. In particular, they distinguish between rules prohibiting injury, theft or promise breaking, on the one hand, and rules prohibiting inappropriate dress, bad manners, or talking in class. On the other, moral transgressions they propose are more serious, usually involve harming victims, and are independent of the say-so of authorities, and involve rules that are general in scope and are justified by appeal to harm, justice, and rights. Conventional transgressions, by contrast, are less serious, and the rules are dependent on the dictates of particular authorities, local in scope, and not justified by reference to harm, justice, or rights. They conclude that their subjects, when questioned about transgressions of rules of both types, judged this distinction between domains as both psychologically real and important. The idea is that these are seen as distinct conceptual domains to which different responses are appropriate because compliance is justified by 
different kinds of reasons. Furthermore, they claim that their conclusions are supported by evidence that this basic division is drawn from toddlers to adults across cultures, classes, and economic classes. Yet, this claim of universally recognized domains has met with severe and broadly convincing criticism. Apart from the citing of contrary evidence, the central objections, objections are several. First, consider seriousness. Some seemingly conventional breaches can be desperately serious. John Elster recounts the story of a young officer in pre-revolutionary France, wealthy but not noble, who having tried to gate crash a party at Versailles, was driven to suicide by the ridicule with which he was greeted. Conversely, actions plainly accepted as immoral, such as corruption and white-collar crime, are often treated with little concern and even indifference. Second, as for harm, justice and rights, seemingly conventional practices such as scarification can be harmful, while violations of prevailing morality such as consensual gay sex harm no one and invade no one's right. Third, as for authority independence, consider the story of Abraham and Isaac and the fact that Jews and Muslims, for instance, view dietary laws as moral because commanded by God. Conversely, most conventional rules are followed irrespective of, irrespective of the dictates of any particular authority. In short, the suggested criteria do not succeed in mapping a difference between kinds of norms as they function in social life. Moreover, it often happens that conventions appear to have a moral aspect. If you fail to observe a conventional norm of politeness, say, you show disrespect and breaking traffic regulations can put others in danger. In general, as Jesse Prince observes, the very same act can count as a moral violation or as a conventional violation, depending on how it is described. Perhaps, then, we should endorse Prince's suggestion that the moral conventional distinction is not a distinction between kinds of rules, but should rather be understood as distinguishing dimensions of rules that we regard as moral and dimensions of rules that we regard as merely conventional. Here we refer, we refers presumably to the psychologists and the, and the locals, to both observers and observed. What then distinguishes the moral way of regarding rules from the conventional way? Prince's answer is that the moral dimensions of rules are psychologically grounded in moral sentiments. More specifically, he proposes that any dimension of a rule enforced by emotions of self-brain and other brain and directed at third parties qualifies as a moral rule. Mature moral judgments, he suggests, are enforced by meta-emotions. If you do something wrong and don't feel guilty, I will be angry at you for your conduct and for your lack of remorse. In sum, to have a moral attitude towards fighting, he writes, one must have a moral sentiment that disposes one to feel a self-directed emotion of blame for fighting and an emotion of other directed blame when someone else, uh, else fights. So for example, we 
When we say that it is morally wrong to disrespect others, we express our belief that we would blame someone for disrespecting others. Then significantly, Prince comments that the disposition for blaming people for behaving in some way may itself be a culturally inculcated value. In addition, notice that the very claim that morality is grounded in moral sentiments is controversial. Rationalists such as Kantians, who ground morality in the ability to form and act on judgments of what ought to do, will not agree. Nor may those psychologists whose hypothesis is that moral judgments arise out of innately given pre-rationalized intuitions or grounded in an intuitive and unconscious moral grammar. In addition, among those who do agree, Prince's proposal is only one among others, and yet, as I shall argue, it is along the right lines.